have written two books and I have copies of them here so you can all look at them and if anybody wants to buy one of course I love that um, but one of them is on um, relationships adult relationships between someone on the spectrum and someone who is not on the spectrum and uh, it's called the partner's guide to Asperger's syndrome and I think that Michael and Brian here are great examples of the fact that there are so many stereotypes that have been broken in the last 20 years about people on the autism Asperger spectrum of different, different learning styles. And um, I was just, not just, two years ago I was at a South American conference for disabilities and they had an autism expert come from Spain. And people were asking him um, if it was possible for people with autism and Asperger's syndrome to have adult relationships that were long term. And he said, oh no, they're not interested in that. And of course, I, not being very shy, just about <coughs> fell off my chair and kept my mouth shut but went over to him afterwards and said, I think maybe you better understand that I have interviewed over 100 couples just for one book on this subject. And these were people I could access relatively easily. So uh, that's just not true. Um, many years ago, we finally started saying that we weren't going to tell the Brian Kings, the Michael McManamans, and the other people that we will never know who have some form of autism, how they feel and what they're supposed to think and do. We started opening this and not using this as much. It's still hard for me because this, you know, this just goes, I, I, you know those chattering teeth? I think I'll be buried with some of those because it's kind of neat. But um, I've had the privilege through my work at MAP Services for Autism and Asperger's Syndrome to listen to families who are coping with um, a loved one who's different than the norm of society in some form of autism. And I've listened to people with autism talk to me about their hopes, their dreams, their wishes, and their problems. And so it's been a very good learning experience for me. I'm the parent of a daughter who has autism. She was diagnosed when she was three years old at a very venerable institution, the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA. At that time, she screamed, she was three. She screamed about 12 hours a day. She could collect nouns and verbs and speak them, but couldn't communicate with them. She had no eye contact, and she seemed to completely not notice her peers. She had never looked us in the eye, ever, no matter what we'd done. And um, when she got diagnosed, they said her, di her prognosis was guarded. Don't you love that? I mean, how many people here have been in a room, you don't have to raise your hands, and you know, waited for the big pronunciation? And, um, usually gets garbled, garbled in a lot of technical language. We were lucky, we're, we were in a place where they really tried to explain what was going on, why they came to that idea, and told us we were good parents. That was 1975, that was very rare then. Most professionals thought that we moms were to blame for our children being different. And um, now Beth has a master's degree a regular, non-adapted master's degree in church music and liturgy. She speaks three languages. She sings professionally and lives by herself in a rented house. Um, she just landed a new job as a Spanish translator for the Autism Society of Indiana. Um, so she way far surpassed what we ever thought she'd do. She's had a serious boyfriend, uh, she loves music and dancing and people. We never have to worry about her opening the door to other people. We just have to worry that she knows no strangers sometimes. Um, and she's candid, so sometimes she'll just say what she thinks, even when I don't want her to. Isn't that something? She is not my puppet, Michael. Yeah, well. And I have to say one thing as a mom. First of all, um, Brian can tell you better than most people I know that there are just as many caring dads out there as there are caring moms and just as many dads who feel an umbilical cord and who worry every day of their lives and would probably cut off an arm if it was going to help their kid. So it's not just us moms. Uh, it's not gender specific. 
and it isn't with you either, my, my good sir. Um, you're a wonderful dad and grandpa. Um, and uh, one of the things that we hear way too much as parents, and I, as whichever parent is the primary t caretaker, here's it the most, usually in school conferences, you've got to learn to let go. I've always fantasized that some social worker would say that to me while I was holding their hands over the John Hancock building over the side, and I'd say, you're right, and I'm letting go. Um, there's nothing I liked more than when I was able to start letting go. There was nothing more joyous, and there was nothing more terrifying. Um, throughout her schooling experience, we had to involve tutors for subjects she was having trouble with. She was brilliant in some subjects, didn't seem to be able to learn others. Um, and we tried to keep her around peers who were friendly and would give her some good feedback when she was not being cool. And, and we did that. And um, she had great teachers who were creative. All these things happened. And then we got to the end of high school and be, way before that, about her sophomore year, we started looking for a place that we thought she'd fit into. She was a terrible tester. Many brilliant people on the spectrum are terrible at taking tests, just terrible, and our daughter's one of them. Um, and so she had just abysmal SAT scores. They were just horrible. And we had to look at a college who would go beyond just the numbers and would look <coughs> at her as a student. And uh, we found that. We spent years going in, opening the door a bit, and telling them what her needs might be when she came to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we took this, this young woman who really wanted to go to college. I mean, there was no motivation tr trouble for her. She was very highly motivated to go. All of her friends were going. So she wanted to go too. She wanted to get out of that house, kiddos. She wanted out of there. Um, and so we worked very hard and the big day came. And um, we got her there. I had fought like you can't believe to convince them she needed a private room that the, you know, that the sleep problems that she had would only be as, uh, uh, I can't say it. Exaggerated. Yes. Uh, no, that's not. Thank you. Exacerbated. Exacerbated. Thank you so much. Boy, 66 is a fun age. <laughs> anyway, by, you know, a roommate coming and going and that type of thing, we figured one thing at a time. Let's get her used to one thing and we'll go to the next. And so we got her there and we set her room up. Really, we took eight hours to set up that room. It looked like a picture of what a neat college dorm room would look like. And we went to the you know, the orientation seminars for the parents, and she went to the ones for the freshmen, blah, blah, blah. Then they had the one together, and then it was time for us to leave. We had found a senior in that college who um, knew her from high school because she had tutored her in algebra. And she had said she was willing to kind of keep an eye out for her. And so we had placed her in a dorm on the same floor as this girl. And um, so we said our goodbyes and took off, and it was in Rensselaer, Indiana. So we took off from the college and took the like five mile trip to the expressway. And as we were getting on, I turned to my husband and said, what do you think we are doing here? This is the stupidest idea we've ever had. Turn the car around, we're going to get her. She's gonna get lost, she's gonna get raped, she's gonna flunk out. What, this is stupid, just turn the car around, we're going back. I don't know what we were thinking. And luckily, as he does so often as we've gotten older, he totally ignored me and kept right on going. <laughs> <laughs> and the tutor told us later that right after we left and there was no more seeing the car in the distance, she had a panic attack and said, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? And her words were, my mom always tells me what to do. What am I gonna do? And um, she said, well, Beth, we're going to go and meet everybody and have a good time. That's what we're going to do. And off she went. And she never looked back from that point. Um, I cannot believe how much she grew in her social abilities and her maturity and her independent skills by being in college. It wasn't an easy road. There were many bumps along that road. Um, when it got cold, uh, the girl saw her one day starting out for class, and she had to walk about a half mile to the classes. This was sort of in a farm field, you know, it was one of those Midwestern Indiana colleges. And she had on summer clothes. 
And they said, Beth, you're going to freeze to death in that. Go back in and change. And she did, thank God. And, and she learned more and more about adapting to what change other than, you know, when she was home and in high school, I'd say, now, Beth, it's supposed to be cold, wear, cold today. Wear something warm. Um, but she made it. She, she got there. And um, one of the things we had to do was allow her the dignity of risk. I was scared many nights. I really was. But I knew that I had to give her this chance and that it was certainly safer than just turning her out into adult life someday. And so that's where we went. And of course, I was hoping that it would help her get a job. But my advice to other families here and people on the spectrum who are looking at vocational opportunities, job opportunities, and higher education opportunities, um, find the college or vocational program or job that best fits the person with the autism spectrum difference as an individual, not, not anything else, but who they are. And is it going to serve their interests? Is it going to be too big and be too overwhelming to them or too small of a college? And then they can never step out of line without the entire college knowing. So you have to look at those things. The same with vocational schools. And is there good mentoring wherever they're going, um, et cetera? Are, you, are they going to have a job someplace where they've got, got to live a really far way away from home where getting home for holidays and things would be financially prohibitive, et cetera. Um, but look at that and, and try to help them find the right fit. And I have a handout out in the hall for people on the spectrum about how to make some of those decisions or advice for making them, not how to make them. I'm not telling any of you what to do. I hardly know what to do myself. Um, beware of programs that say, oh, well, we've helped people with disabilities for years, so don't worry about a thing. Um, Find out, have they helped people with a unique set of abilities and challenges of someone on the autism Asperger spectrum? Because if they just dealt with physical handicaps or with people who have um, straight learning disabilities, they may not be um, proactive enough to be sufficiently helpful. Um, and ask questions of many people wherever you're looking. If it's an employer, um, one of the biggest decisions you have to make is, are you going to disclose the person with Asperger's? Do they choose to disclose their disability? And if not, then you may be setting them up for a lot of misunderstandings along the way. But yet you don't want to pre-disable them and say, oh, no, look out for Johnny. You know, forget that. Johnny is a great person, and Johnny is Johnny. But the point is, if he does have difference in learning styles or social styles, try to explain them. You don't have to use a label to do that, but explain them in some way. And then be sure that you sit down with the, your loved one and talk about their strengths and weaknesses very honestly. What are the things that are hardest for you and what are the things you're best at? And make sure that those are pointed out with where they're going into their next environment. I want to say to all of you, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I have a great deal of respect for this panel um, and, and, and each of the perspectives they're going to give you. I am going to be leading a tour for adults on the spectrum to Costa Rica to a retreat there at, uh, called Leaves and Lizards. It's an organic farm and ranch near Ma the uh, Arenal Volcano in north central Costa Rica. And I do have information on that if any of you are interested. If you don't ride a horse, you might want to learn to ride a horse because they have Pirelli trained horses there. And it's so much fun to go on the trail rides. But there's hiking opportunities and incredible nature tours, etc., and all organic food. And they grow their own food on the property, including their meats. And they do have gluten-free diets available. So if anybody's interested in that, great. I have my business cards here um, okay. if you want to ask me something later. Thank okay. you so much. That was great.